An 8-meter-long aluminum boat traces a straight, slow line across the northern part of Yellowstone Lake. Two instruments are installed at the stern of the ship. Someone surveys the lake floor with narrow-gauge sonar, recording echoes to capture the rise and fall of the lake floor. Others fire periodic seismic shock waves into the lake. The waves penetrate the lake bed before being reflected back, revealing images of the sediment and rock layers beneath the lake bed. Morgan organized the project with Pat Shanks, a USGS geochemist who had begun studying hydrothermal vents in the lake. He desperately needed a map of the lake floor to replace the time-consuming method of searching for vents, venturing out onto the flat surface of the water by boat in the morning to see where gas bubbles rose from the vents beneath. Morgan, Shanks, and several other scientists gathered every night in a nearby building to review new maps of the lake bottom the technicians were printing. It feels like cataracts being removed from your eyes, Morgan says, like night and day. Soon these maps revealed unknown structures southwest of Mary Bay. Now called Elliott Crater, this 830-meter-wide depression is the third-largest hydrothermal crater in the world. That same month, people crowded into the ship's cabin to watch live video as the remote-controlled submarine descended about 50 meters underwater for a closer look. The inner walls of the crater appear almost vertical in the murky water. Foot-long suckerfish, lined up like airplanes on the edge of the crater, Morgan recalled. They like hot water. The sub explored several smaller craters, some the size of two football fields, located within Elliott Crater. Inside there are hydrothermal vents. These vents are often flanked by a layer of microbes. Tiny crustaceans swirl outside the fiery plumes of water, feeding on drifting microbes, while trout dart in and out, hunting the crustaceans. The ROV's mechanical arm catches rocks from below. Examining them later, Shanks discovered the rocks were flecked with green and blue signs of the iron and magnesium-rich mineral chloride, which forms when hydrothermal water changes the rocks beneath the lake or cements together sediments at the bottom of the lake. The samples are thought to be rock fragments that were thrown into the air as a result of the explosion, some of which fell back into the crater. The team spent the next three months in September mapping the rest of the lake bed. We discovered that this lake is much more hydrothermally and tectonically active than anyone thought. Several active faults cross the lake. More than 250 hydrothermal vents are located within the V-shaped basin where hot water dissolves or escapes from the bottom of the lake. Apart from Elliott Crater, the team discovered two other craters that are at least half a kilometer wide and many craters that are less than 200 meters wide. Here and there, round domes jutted from the bottom of the lake. The seismic profile shows that the rock is soft sediment covered by a hard crust. Each dome may mark where hydrothermal water exits from one or more vents and is embedded in sediment with silicate minerals and chloride. Over time, a watertight barrier forms, so less water escapes from the vent. As pressure builds beneath it, the lid slowly buckles, Bedrosian said. If such a dome is tightly closed, you will get a pressure cooker, not a boiling pot on the surface. This can lead to disaster. In fact, during the ROV dive, Morgan and Shanks saw what appeared to be the edge of a damaged dome on the edge of Elliott Crater. They also found hundreds of intact domes. Most are less than 2 meters but some are much larger. The North Basin Hydrothermal Dome, for example, stretches 750 meters and rises seven stories above the lake bed. Hot water escapes from the dome through dozens of tiny vents, at least for now. 
But over time, that will change, and those open spaces will become covered in silica, Morgan said. If this happens, it is a perfect candidate for a potential hydrothermal explosion.